University of Scranton, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the opening events for the exhibition A Broader Social Vision, District Nursing in Early 20th Century Scranton. An exhibition organized to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Visiting Nurse Association of Lackawanna County. A centennial is a great milestone and we are honored to work with the Visiting Nurse Association in commemoration of a century's worth of public nursing in Scranton. Many organizations and individuals have contributed to the success of the exhibition as well as its related catalog and programming. We first thank the staff of the Visiting Nurse Association of Lackawanna County in Oliphant, Pennsylvania for their enthusiastic support of this project and their great generosity in sharing archival materials with us. Executive Director Beth McGuigan and Administrative Assistant Gail Padfield extended every courtesy to our essayists. Josephine Dunn, Professor of Art History, and Marian Farrell, Professor of Nursing, both at the University of Scranton, during their long and productive days of research. As the present day manifestation of early efforts to promote public health care documented here, the VNA continues to embody the ideals of both health and compassion, essential to its forebears. And the agency has also been a careful steward of its historical records. And we acknowledge its conscientious work in preserving an important part of women's history in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We also acknowledge help with research provided by Sal Santoli, Assistant Director of the Scranton Counseling Center, also Scranton, PA. Doctors Dunn and Farrell will be sharing presentations with us concerning the history of district nursing in Scranton. Uh, but before they begin, I'd like to share some thoughts with you about the seal used by the District Nursing Association in the 1920s. It might seem odd on a seal for a nursing organization to see a woman with a shovel <laughs> planting a tree. Uh, she doesn't seem to be particularly involved in a medical endeavor there. Um, but the inscription below her, when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life, um, from the verse Proverbs 13, 12, is actually kind of telling. And if you read the entire verse in, in context and take a look at the image of the woman with the tree, it actually tells you some really beautiful things about the mission of district nursing in Scranton when it began. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. So the idea of hope and sickness being opposed to each other and, and being somehow related uh, is, is sort of at the foundation of a lot of district nursing ideals. When early advocates of district nursing in Scranton began their work, curing illness was only one part of what they sought to achieve. Beyond the physical symptoms of sickness, hopelessness itself was considered to be very debilitating for many people who were struggling to earn a living in turn of the century Scranton, which was a growing industrial city and a very difficult environment um, in many respects. Uh, it's difficult to remain healthy and productive when one is overwhelmed by the daily demands of living, and the goal of a district nurse was to address this issue as well. Not only was she supposed to alleviate illness, she was supposed to alleviate despair. In the words of District Nurse Superintendent Grace Smith in 1912, there is no one like a district nurse to encourage self-respect, self-reliance, and to carry hope to the homes of those that she visits. So hope is also a, a major factor in district nursing, not only the idea of health, but also bringing hopefulness to the people um, that the nurses are serving. I welcome now uh, Dr. Josephine Dunn, who is our guest curator for the exhibition. Uh, she will in turn welcome Dr. Marion Farrell, who is one of our guest essayists for our catalog, and we will hear some of their diverse perspectives on the history of district nursing. Please welcome Dr. Dunn. Good afternoon. Welcome to our exhibition about an organization that for 100 incorporated years and 117 public nursing years honors the best traditions of women's activism in our community. We celebrate Women's History Month by honoring the Visiting Nurse Association of Lackawanna County. For the exhibition in the Hope Horn Gallery that documents early history of the Visiting Nurses Association, we've published a catalog that reproduces most of the images that you will see in the gallery this afternoon. The catalog also contains two essays on this history, which began in 1912 as the District Nurse Association of Scranton. Both essays are important contexts for viewing the exhibition. My intention now is not to duplicate my essay in this pre-exhibition lecture, 
Rather, I would like to add more information to a subject that has fascinated me for the past couple of years, the beginnings of public health care in early 20th century Scranton and the roles that women played in furthering it. This afternoon, I will focus on a few contexts that surrounded the birth of district nursing in Scranton. So let's start with first the following fact. In 1890, a little over 75,000 people called Scranton home. By 1900, this number had swelled to over 102,000 people, making Scranton the 38th largest city in America. We're talking about a boom city with new growing industries drawing immigrant workers and native entrepreneurs in large numbers to the banks of the Lackawanna River. To a certain extent, we could say that district nursing came to Scranton in direct response to the Depression of 1893-94. But nursing was not the original intent of the organization that was started and that ultimately employed Scranton's first district nurses. During the Depression of 1893, Scranton ministers formed an organization based on Boston's associated charities. In effect, Scranton formed a union of charities. They provided relief for the jobless through a new and scientific method of administering charity. This new method essentially entailed an overlay of supervision on local philanthropy. Those who needed assistance were required to apply, to apply for it. They were investigated as to their worthiness and were supplied not with a handout, but with the means to raise themselves from poverty. The goal was, as they phrased it, to make the dependent independent and the pauper self-supporting. A primary focus of Associated Charities was creation of a registry which would distinguish imposters from the worthy and prevent duplication of services. One of the board members had expert training in public charities work. His name was Colonel Henry Morton Boyce, who had been appointed since 1893 as one of three investigators on the Pennsylvania State Board of Charities. To him fell the duty of devising the structure, the protocols, vision, and goals of public charity in Scranton. Few in Scranton knew better than he the problems inherent to the administration of charitable and reformatory work in Pennsylvania. His book, Prisoners and Paupers, published in 1893, posited recommendations for associated charities to follow in Scranton. Interestingly enough, he was also husband to the woman credited with founding district nursing, Elizabeth Dixon Boyce, and we'll talk a little bit more about her shortly. Let's get back to the Depression. With the founding of Associated Charities, much more happened, way much more happened, than the institution of a charity police nested in a well-run bureaucracy. District nursing was born, and here's the story. Associated Charities of Scranton, founded in 1893, began with one woman on staff and a board of male directors, a mayor, industrialists, businessmen, ministers, and the lone Annie Dugan, hired as agent or field worker. It was Dugan's job to review applications for assistance, investigate candidates in their homes, find work for the jobless, and particularly to root out instances of child abuse, which at this time entailed street begging, child slavery, petty thievery, drinking, and other such vices. In the beginning, Associated Charities dealt by force of circumstance with unemployment. Companies and battalions of unemployed, one board member exclaimed, waylaid him on the street, crowded his office, and waited for him at home. Men unable to work were being referred to the Poor Board, a municipal public assistance office, and those who were hale and hardy were given jobs in collaboration with the mayor's office and the park commission. The unemployed found $1 a day jobs, cleaning Scranton streets, clearing the city parks, cutting wood and stone. As industrious as Mrs. Dugan was in creating these jobs with board assistance, 
And as assiduous as Associated Charities was in raising funds, there were never enough jobs to meet demands in 1894. While most of the unemployed were single young men in the spring of 1894, husband miners and husband laborers in Scranton were working only 16 hours a week and could barely support their families. Community members and businesses donated food and supplies, and one very intrepid gentleman, Mr. Reinhardt, donated an incredible 2,500 pounds of fish for the poor through associated charities. But there never seemed, never seemed, to be enough money or supplies or jobs to go around. Within a month of opening its office, Associated Charities realized that there were additional problems they could not ignore in public relief work. After two months, Associated Charities board members were asking city charities to take in and care for those needing more than a job. The Home for the Friendless and the House of the Good Shepherd were asked to provide temporary lodging and meals for women. Also solicited were the Florence Crittenden Mission for Reclaimed Women, the St. Joseph's Foundling Home, St. Patrick's Orphan Asylum, the Rescue Mission, the YWCA. The names of these organizations alone reveal a game plan, a new one, at work in Associated Charities. It's not simply unemployment, but the conditions of women and children that were also being addressed during the Depression. In her first annual report to the board in November 1894, Agent Annie Dugan informed that she had tried to find the causes for poverty and done away with them. She had 900 investigations in hand, and with these she built a registry of the sick poor, tabulating applicants by name, residence, nationality, religious persuasion, age, civil condition, present need, and the causes thereof, and the amount of aid rendered. No one, asserted the board, who has not had experience can realize what tact, gentleness, and firmness it requires to make these investigations, and to find the truth in each case without injuring the independence or destroying the confidence of the individual investigated. During 1894, Dugan sent 11 people to Lackawanna Hospital and depended on a local druggist for medicine supplied to more than 40 families. 1895 would be no different. Increasing numbers of women applicants were being sent to Lackawanna Hospital and other institutions for the sick. Associated Charities asked for the help of women in the community to assist with visitations to the sick poor, but they were understandably reluctant to visit immigrant neighborhoods far from their own homes and surrounded by contagious diseases like diphtheria and scarlet fever. At the second annual meeting of Associated Charities, Board President Ezra Ripple in October 1895 described Dugan's difficult working conditions. Quote, Our agent has been called upon this year to take charge of many cases of sickness especially contagious diseases. It's impossible for her to do this personally and at the same time to attend to the investigation of the applicants. She's also found it extremely difficult to secure women to care for these sick persons. It would seem that the time has come for us to have at least one district nurse whose time might be at the disposal of the board. Such a nurse, when not directly employed ministering to the sick, would find abundant work in teaching the ignorant how to live. And it's at this point that district nursing becomes a part of Scranton history. Fundraising was undertaken and donations solicited from benevolent men in the community. By January 1896, Dugan reported that funding had been raised to support a district nurse for one year and a whopping $90 was deposited in a nurse's account by February. Yet already, on December 1st, 1895, Mary F. Kissel was at work as Scranton's first district nurse. So what is a district nurse? Well, 
you could say that it was late 19th century Scranton's direct connection to Florence Nightingale, who had brought the true science and craft of nursing to public attention during the Crimean War of 1853 to 56. Most students of nursing history know the importance of Florence Nightingale to battleground nursing, but remember too that she is the co-founder of District Nursing. Nightingale once stated that the ultimate destination of all nursing is nursing of the sick in their own homes. In 1862, she advised Scotsman philanthropist William Rathbone, who was establishing a public nursing service for the poor in his hometown of Liverpool. Rathbone's idea was to focus on public education and preventative care as much as on the act of healing. Five years later, he had succeeded in dividing Liverpool into 18 districts, each with its own nurse. An even larger district nursing program, designed along the same lines, was created following the Jubilee celebration of Queen Victoria, her 50, 50 years as monarch. The Queen Victoria Jubilee Institute for Nurses was founded in 1889 as a corps of nurses supervised not by a religious or a philanthropic body, but by superintendents and inspectors who were educated women and highly trained nurses. Untrained women were enlisted as well. They became health missionaries, giving lectures and instructions to the poor on sanitation and hygiene. America sent its first nurse fact finder from Boston to England in 1884 to study district nursing in Liverpool. By 1893 at the Chicago World's Fair, a conference of district nurses was being held and America taking her cue from England was building a district nursing tradition of its own by the 1890s. Scranton participated in this flowering of public health initiatives, looking both to Boston and Chicago for inspiration. Importantly, from the outset, Scranton initiatives were well connected to American cities where district nursing was born. Surviving records reveal nothing about Nurse Kiesel's training or background, but both would have been important to her hire. Florence Nightingale had insisted both upon medical training for nurses and their ability to both educate and nurse to educate the poor and sick in healthy living. Presumably, Kissel brought both educational and nursing skills to her job. But remember, in Scranton of 1895, trained nurses didn't exist. The training school for nurses at Lackawanna Hospital, founded two years earlier, had just graduated its first class of hospital nurses, all five of them. Kissel's special role in local history then was to pilot and model a new form of public health care called district nursing, not only for the associated charities, but for the Scranton medical community at large. To date, only one of Kissel's two annual reports has been found. She delivered it in 1896, after six months on the job. Primarily, the report is a statement of fact indicating 320 visits to 59 sick families and 11 deaths. But more importantly, Kissel's report reflects her nursing vision and philosophy. And for this reason, I will let Ms. Kissel speak for herself. She said, quote, The most pathetic fact in history is the effort of men and women to care for their sick. Sickness, disease, and suffering have entered unbidden into many poor homes this year. The cure for the sick and firm among the poor is a problem, which many times is hard and discouraging owing to tired and worn out mothers, and that often there are not the means or homes to care for those they love. There are many things I could suggest in the coming year, such as nourishment and old linens, flowers, etc., to brighten and aid all the sick poor of our city, and would ask the many who can give such things also to visit with us some of the homes where any little kindness will be received like God's sunshine." Unquote. 
For one year, Mary Kissel dutifully submitted monthly reports chronicling her nursing services. Alas, her reports are not always fully cited in the board minutes, nor is the information she provides as complete as that provided meticulously by her, her heirs in 1912. Kissel cites having tended contagious diseases like diphtheria, scarlet fever, and typhoid fever, as well as general debilities, consumptive cases, and opium addicts. By mid-1897, a diphtheria outbreak in Dunmore was spreading, and there was every need of a district nursing service in Scranton. Ironically, this was not to be. When the Associated Charities met in January 1897, Miss Kissel's one-year hire had expired. The board asked Mrs. Dugan to meet with various gentlemen in the community who'd expressed an interest in funding the nurse for an additional year. We don't know whether a full or partial salary was raised, but we do know that Nurse Kissel continued to tend Scranton's sick poor. As she was entering the final months of her employment, another medical event was occurring. Formation of Scranton's first homeopathic hospital, Hahnemann, in June 1897, a hospital managed and directed entirely by women. Involved in this project were a foursome of local figures whose sense of duty to public health has been well documented. Colonel Henry Martin Boyce, you know him now, his wife, Elizabeth Dixon Boyce, Dr. Anna Callista Clark, and Nurse Superintendent Blanche Childs. The three women, all three of them, in 1912 would become prime movers in incorporation of Scranton's District Nurse Association. But what about Miss Kissel in 1897? We've left her hanging here. Her reports from January to June 1897 document 17 cases. But by June, problems are on the horizon. The nurse's account was overdrawn by $35. Maybe not much today, but in 1897, it was a considerable amount of money. As June stretched into December, the account continued in deficit. And by the end of the year, it was overdrawn by $135. Surely, Ms. Kissel was aware of the gravity of her position. In November, she made a belated attempt in her monthly report to clarify the actual amount of work she was doing for only three patients. But her consistently low patient load and the overdrawn account brought the Associated Charities to a crossroads decision. At the December 1897 monthly board meeting, Ms. Kissel was conspicuous in her absence. She's always been present at every board meeting from the moment she's hired in December 1895. In December 1897, she's not there. And the board minutes relate very simply, but I also think rather tellingly, quote, the secretary made a verbal report for the nurse whose work, while apparently limited, is large in results. It's probably not surprising to read afterwards that on January 11th, 1898, Scranton's first district nurse submitted a letter of resignation, which the board accepted two weeks later. The general treasury absorbed the overdrawn nurse's account, and rather than continue its district nursing service, the board voted to do something else entirely they voted to obtain an assistant for Mrs. Dugan. According to the board, Dugan would assume the duties of a district nurse in, attention, in addition to her duties as agent. Now, think about it. That Mrs. Dugan would even be considered a viable substitute for a district nurse suggests that Associated Charities maybe did not really understand the special training and goals this professional job entailed, or Perhaps they did, but could do no less in 1898 than try to provide any form of medical care, however they could, in financially straightened circumstances. It happens that in 1898, they were actually in a better position vis-a-vis -vis local nursing support. 
not one now, but two training schools for nurses in Scranton had graduated their first class of nurses in hospital work, Lackawanna Hospital and Moses Taylor. So from 1898 through 1909, local trained nurses, though lacking the specialized training of district nursing, cared for Scranton's sick poor when requested by associated charities. Mary Kissel's resignation came at a time of medical emergency in Scranton. During the summer of 1897, diphtheria had broken out in Dunmore, and there was fear of a citywide epidemic. How extraordinary that another group of women then raised the banner of public health. They assumed responsibility for educating the public on preventative uh, care and quarantine. Few today know about the Green Ridge Women's Club, founded in 1898, but it was truly a force of nature in late 19th century Scranton. Collective action by these women addressed clean water and ultimately closed down the Providence Water Company. They investigated the local milk industry and succeeded in getting municipal laws passed that required the inspection of cows and milk. They studied ventilation and sewage in schools in short, they were themselves little Florence Nightingales in their industry to root out the causes of contagious disease in the city. So while these ladies of the Green Ridge uh, Women's Club advocated reform and pressured for municipal action, Scranton's small core of trained nurses were adding their talent to the pool of women's work for public health in Scranton in 1898. Not until 1909, would public health care, Nightingale style, return to Scranton, when Scranton's second district nurse, Blanche Childs, was hired by Associated Charities. With her salary donated, Childs set about creating the organization that exists today. The annual report she submitted in 1909 attests both her administrative skill and her nursing vision. She saw the necessity of dividing the city into districts, each staffed by one or more nurses. She designed the blue seersucker uniform each nurse wore, saw to provision of their medicine bags, and required all to maintain daily records at a central office. She set up the fee schedule and nurses' working schedules and solicited the support of local churches in providing monthly baskets for the needy. When Childs began a fundraising campaign, Elizabeth Dixon Boyce stepped forward with $1,000. This was followed by a large body of women whose contribution of money and committee work would ultimately ensure the success of district nursing in Scranton. Nurse Blanche Childs, our second official district nurse, resigned in October 1911 just as the District Nurses Association was deciding to incorporate. The organization she envisioned and for which she laid the foundation was inherited by Grace E. Smith, who served as nurse superintendent of the DNA during its heroic formation, 1912 through 1920. Smith had graduated from Philadelphia's Hahnemann Hospital program in 1897. Before joining the DNA, she served as superintendent for Scranton's homeopathic Hahnemann Hospital, 1899 through 1912. In this position, she had made a fateful acquaintance with hospital founder, president, and board member, Elizabeth Dixon Boyce and her husband. There's no doubt that the story of public nursing in Scranton begins with one determined patron, Elizabeth Dixon Boyce about whom we have written in the exhibition catalog. But this afternoon, I think we can admit as well that a remarkable trinity of dedicated district nurses may be called founding mothers as well. Their names are rarely spoken in local history, yet any study of the history of health and medicine in our community must include them. And so this afternoon, I honor Mary F. Kissel, Blanche Childs, and Grace E. Smith, our first district nurses. And now, Marion shall tell you of some of the accomplishments of Scranton's district nurses through 1927.
Hello, everyone. I also want to point out that uh, Juliana Ostrowski is a senior nursing student, and she also participated in the project with us. And it was a great honor to have her with us, simply because as a future nurse, she's going to be graduating shortly. And it's just nice to share that journey with her. Uh, I put up there the, you know, the skills, communication, collaboration, organization, and nursing. And just thinking about what nurses really do on a day-to-day -day journey in terms of taking care of individuals, nurses and those involved in healthcare services require specific skill sets to meet the needs of clients. So when you think about Mrs. Dugan, uh, you begin to wonder, you know, really was it that people were hard pressed? Or did that begin the thoughts about, well, anybody could do what a nurse does? Um, there's lots of stories locally about a Mrs. Dugan, and I think that was the Mrs. Dugan. But a strong sense of commitment was certainly demonstrated by the women in the community. And, and this is a story that uh, Jody and myself tried to unearth, and, and truly we are grateful for those individuals at the VNA that allowed us to do this. Uh, it's a story of progressive women of their time uh, who had a vision, and truly a vision, of improving the quality of life and the quality of health care for those that lived in their community. When we look back in 1895 and think of that number, 320 care visits, you think, well, that's not bad. But you think about the conditions of life at that time. That's a nurse having to walk to 320 homes in conditions that were pretty difficult. And to think about the traveling on her feet in those conditions that the streets were not paved. Um, there wasn't any type of even a bus. You know, the only thing that was going to get her to that house was going to be her own two feet. And so, again, that type of commitment. There was also a great need for collaboration. And the collaboration of resources, and certainly Jody has uh, described some of them. Uh, Mrs. Boyce was certainly a great leader of that time. She recognized the need for additional resources time and time again. And at one point, she wrote to the Chicago Visiting Nurse Association for information to determine how best to establish partnerships within the community, and also with individuals within the community. And so she further developed that relationship that she had already established with those that were at um, Hahnemann Hospital, which is now, of course, Geisinger Community Medical Center. And she looked at how best to use nursing students and so later on, I'll describe that affiliation a little bit more. But that, that was a wonderful opportunity. It was great for the patients. It was great for the nursing students. And it continued for many years afterwards. By December 1909, Mrs. Boyce started to formulate a nursing organization. And it was the District Nursing Association. But it, was, um, it had been a department of the Civic Improvement Society. It took over the nursing department of the Associated Charities and Human Society, uh, the Humane Society. And again, it sounds so easy rattling off all of these organizations, except that as Jody and I went and, and kept reading through, and it, and it was so difficult to kind of, well, that association belonged to this association, and, and that one turned over to this one. And to think about that this was a group of women that utilized their relationships. And so that degree of collaboration that they knew, but they also had a vision. And they knew that they had to use that to keep moving it forward. So they never looked at their self. They looked at where they were moving toward. And, and that's something that certainly uh, sets an example for all of us. The first branch office was called the West Side Branch of District Nursing. Uh, Department of City, uh, City Improvement Association, and it was at 330 North Washington Avenue. It was on the first floor. 
and one of the notes said that they had a free telephone installed. But, and they made a big deal about it, and of course it was. Can you imagine trying to run the VNA today without a telephone? You know, <laughs> can you imagine without a computer? Can you imagine that once the nurse left the office, she had no way of communicating with anyone. She's out on her own. So the very fact that there was a telephone available, well, that was great. Uh, and more than likely that once she traveled, there were very few telephones once she did leave the office. The aim of the department was to provide a sufficient number of visiting nurses to care for the sick who are unable to care or employ the, the services of a trained nurse. And I know most nurses today kind of cringe at the idea of being called a trained nurse. But the origin of that term is coming from this era, where almost anyone could have stepped up to the plate and said, well, I'm a nurse. You know, there's Mrs. Dugan taking over the role of the responsibilities of what the nurse was doing. And so to enter into that job opportunity as a nurse, it, it, it sort of heightened your abilities then to say, well, I'm a trained nurse. I went to a program and I completed the program and so I'm a trained nurse. And so there were levels of training and, and so it began and we're still dealing with it in 2012. But the planning, and, and Jody already mentioned it, five districts, someone had to come in and kind of look at Scranton and say, well, you know, one nurse really can't do this anymore. We need to have some districts. And so we look at organizational skills. Again, very critical. We have to look at who can come into this role as a nurse and, and really have organizational skills to do it. So they're essential, particularly in the early years. Each district, by quotes here that we found in, in the uh, records, thoroughly efficient nurse. So this woman had to be a thoroughly efficient nurse. And they also began to look at that this was a, a woman, and they were all women at the time, who had spent at least three years in hospital training. So there was not going to be any newbie out there. Okay, this was a woman who was going to have three years of hospital training. The District Nurse Association prob uh, proudly advertised the availability of taking calls from any part of the city, needing services of the visiting nurse. In addition, individuals could receive services at the main office. And so there's some descriptions of how they could do this, and it would have been interesting to look at some of the small ads. And every now and then you did see an ad in the newspaper, as crisp as some of these ads were. But the individuals were told they could, you know, they could call anytime between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Um, and if the call came in then, uh, they would be able to get, you know, if the call were, were to be received during that time, they could get a visit in that particular day. If the call came in after 1 o'clock, well, they would get a call by the visiting nurse the next day. If it was an emergent call, immediate attention would be given if possible. Supplies necessary in caring for the sick were also furnished. And that's also an interesting case in terms of how those supplies were obtained. In all cases, except for contagious diseases, Okay, because that brought out another case. You know, if we had one nurse and then later one nurse for each district, well, that would be okay if none of you had a contagious disease. But what if one of you had a contagious disease? Well, you wouldn't want me to come to your house after I'd been to Margaret and she had a contagious disease. So that brought up another issue. We had to get that poor nurse that was the contagious disease nurse. My mother is now 84, and she could tell you about what it was like to have that house that was marked. And they used to put up big signs that it was marked, you know, that you had somebody with a contagious disease. If you had somebody that had diphtheria or scarlet fever or some of these other diseases of these times. And so, again, 
it was the district nurse that went in and there was one nurse that was deemed to be the contagious nurse who actually went from home to home, but the value that she provided not only in her care, but also in the expertise of not caring with her from home to home, the contagious disease. Individuals who were acute cases were visited daily for as long as needed. There was no insurance cut off. Uh, you know, that you could get your care for as long as you needed. Uh, and if you couldn't pay for it, okay. If you couldn't pay the standard go, which was 25 cents a visit at this time, okay. If you could pay the 25 cents, great. All right. But again, think about operating an agency like that in today's world, all right, where you know, your average costs are certainly more than 25 cents a visit, and you're only allowed X number of visits per client. A very different world. Chronic visits were visited as long as it was necessary to make the patient comfortable. And then true to its mission, the association furnished nurses free of charge. Okay. And again, the money collected was used. So anytime, and again, when we reviewed uh, the collection, there was a number of fundraising projects. And so that was what was used. And individuals who looked at the mission of, of this association knew the value because time and time again it was recorded throughout that what the nurses did was not just care for that particular individual, but the care that they provided for that individual was the care that they provided for the community. And that was the value. It wasn't just for that individual that caring for the sick was caring for the community. And I think that's something that we've long forgotten about. The other part of it is, is that financial knowledge is very important. And when we look at how the financial support came, there was fundraising, there was also private donations, there were fees from paying customers. There was also local and county agencies, commercial interests. Remember, around 1910 to 1912, it was 25 cents a visit. Between 1912 and 1915, it went up to about 45 cents. By 1919, it was up to 50 cents a visit. The salary of a nurse, okay, was, was somewhat questionable, okay? The poor board was negotiating the salary of the nurse and, and negotiating what the, the fees were for each of the visits to cover that. And so oftentimes as you're going through the, the history here, you're looking at a lot of discussion about, well, we'll have four nurses. Well, we didn't collect enough of the money to cover the cost of the nurse, so one of the nurses is going to have to be let go for a while and maybe rehired in a while. And so again, very true to today, okay, where we have layoffs and we're looking at, you know, what is brought in in terms of economic resources has a direct impact on the number of nurses there to care for individuals. And so a lot of what happens at this time has, you know, some of that still happens today. We're looking at awareness of the socioeconomic and sociocultural impact related to environment and health. Nurses provided special attention to the care of newborns, to children, and to mothers. Nurses provided special instructions on nutrition, prenatal care, newborn care, child care. And took a particular interest in looking at prevention and facilitating recovery. Again, same things today. If we looked at the curriculum of nursing, we're still doing that today in 2012. We look at, in the early uh, 1900s, the types of infections that are going on, malaria, you know, transmission from infected mosquitoes. We're looking at diphtheria brought about by um, bacteria. 
you know, so we, we might not have some of the same types of infections, but we're dealing with looking at helping students learn how to best care for those individuals that they meet in the multiple types of arenas. Organization is also very important for nurses. In the years between 1911 and 1912, it's a very transitional time for this group of individuals. On April 28th, 1911, begins the first mention of separating to form a new organization, and Mrs. Boyce encourages the members of the board to remain part of the City Improvement Association for just one more year, and not to join the Century Club. And then uh, we're looking at transition from uh, Miss Blanche Childs resigning in 1911, Miss Grace Smith becoming the superintendent, and then the filing in um, 2012, or I'm sorry, 1912, where the district nurse becomes uh, chartered. So again, by 1912, we have six trained nurses uh, under Grace Smith as the supervisor. And what a transition of time, because we're, we're as each person comes in and takes over the district, we're also looking at the credentials of that person who's a supervisor and, and where that individual is coming and their background. And it's just a wonderful history, that in and of itself. When we look at uh, the need for the care of individuals with contagious diseases, by 1915, we have a, a separate place in Scranton, which is a disease for contagious, a hospital for uh, contagious diseases, which most individuals that are from the local community recognize that we had a sanatorium for individuals with tuberculosis. But there was also a, another hospital, and that was for just contagious diseases. So that we actually had two facilities. Uh, in 1912, there was also uh, an outbreak in typhoid fever, and it was actually two nurses from this um, that were district nurses, Miss Nettie Evans and Miss Sydney Hall, and they were called into play to go up to a place called the Hillside Home. The Hillside Home is what is now Clark Summit State Hospital. And they went up there and they actually cared for approximately 700 people who were institutionalized at that place uh, and, and took care of those individuals. Uh, and again, nurses going in without any thought to their own personal welfare. Uh, it's, it's just incredible the courage that this group of women over and over throughout the years had. When we look at what women did as nurses at this time too, they became very active in the community. They looked at, you know, maybe similar to what the, the group in Greenridge did in terms of taking on, you know, what has to be done in terms of the drinking water situation. That's really what had caused the, the outbreak of typhoid up at um, the Hillside Home. When we look at the number of typhoid outbreaks in this community, there were quite a few. All right, and a number of lives are lost over the years. When we look at the complexity and the flexibility of nursing and how essential it is for nurses to know what to do and when to do it and how long to do it, and to think that over time, how important it is for the community to recognize the value of nursing. Uh, another role that nurses played and continue to play is within the schools. Uh, nurses, beginning somewhere around 1912, played a very important role in school nursing. They actually did the inspections, and, and they called them the inspections, but what a great idea. They recognized, one, the value of, of children being kept in school and completing their education. And the role that they played in it is that if they were there and were able to do one, preventative screening, and two, get in there and help kids get back into school, so they also did home evaluations, that kids had a much, uh, they were more likely to be able to stay in school and complete school. 
and and what a great advantage to the whole community. So that began somewhere around 20, uh, 1912, and they did that for a number of years, and then eventually the Scranton School District took on that role. But that began with uh, the district nurses. The district nurses also looked at uh, they went ahead and they looked at prenatal care and they said, you know, we don't have enough nurses to take care of all the women that are pregnant. So we have to think about how we can organize this differently. They, uh, they thought about organizing um, older adolescents who would be AIDS. So they taught the adolescents how to give bats, how to do some basic child care. And then they brought them back in, and they had moms come in and learn how to give bats, how to keep children clean, the basic health care things. Uh, they did wellness programs. And again, when we reviewed the articles, they had uh, how to how to take care of your babies, and, and they did a growth and development perspective. So they had like charts, they had programs, they had magazines, and you don't see that in our local community. You know, kids today, we talk about it all the time, and new moms are just expected to know how to do that. And yet, in the early 1900s, they're doing programs directing how to do it. And we don't do that now. We just expect people, they know how to do it. We don't know any more how to do it today than they did back then. And yet, wow, what a great job they did. Um, the district nurses sat around and they said, well, you know, prenatal care is important. We're going to teach women how to take care of themselves while they're pregnant. And if needed, we'll be available to go into the home and actually do home births. So there was an era of time when they actually went in and they did home births. Uh, they also looked at doing follow-up care with both the mom and the baby because they looked at high risk in terms of follow-up care with morbidity and mortality and, and looking at that perhaps if they were able to step in, they could reduce the morbidity and mortality of both the mom and the baby, and, and so they did a great job with that. They also looked at mm, what if we not only taught moms to do better in terms of helping with growth and development, but what if we also stepped in and looked at providing more on mental health? And the, they spent a number of years developing a program and then actually implement, implementing a program in terms of mental health. The amount of advertising that they were able to achieve I think it's incredible. I, I was just overwhelmed every time that I would go through and I, w I would look at it and just see, wow, isn't this great? The, their foresight was uh, is unbelievable. The one problem that would come up when they were dealing with moms and young children is that, you know, the milk delivery system was an issue. And so they decided that they would do something about it. Um, in 1916, the director of public health in Scranton wrote an article, and it was about the uh, high incidence of infant mortality in the city. And so they all sat around, and, the, and they discussed what they could do. And they, they took issue with developing a controlled and supervised milk supply. And so again, the, um, in 1918, the uh, Baby Welfare Department began the work of the Well Baby Clinics. And again, these were run by the, the district nurses. The first Well Baby Clinic opened in June 15, 1918. And, uh, you know, in quotes, um, our nurses are doing a good follow up working and teaching mothers the right way to care for their children in the home as to feeding, dressing, and cleanliness. Um, as part of this, they also had milk stations. And so the delivery of clean milk, so that this clean milk was reducing the incidence of diseases for children. 
Um, the milk stations started somewhere around March 1918. And again, the milk was generally free. Um, it was financed through the generosity of the Social Com Committee of the Civics Department of the Century Club, um, but it was distributed through the district nurses. So again, just the thoughts of, of what these uh, individuals are doing, always in collaboration with other groups. The prenatal nurse that was included in the district nurse services started somewhere around 1922. It was established at the Westside Hospital. This clinic was the first in the country. And that's unbelievable. And again, something that few people would recognize as happening in Scranton. Uh, when you look at the uh, amount of things that happened, because nurses were so involved in the health care, they also looked at negotiating contracts with different insurance companies. Probably the biggest one was Metropolitan Life. This group of women who were involved in district nurses knew that the because of the economic situations that were going on around them that many people weren't able to afford even what we look at as a very small amount for a visit so they thought hmm what else can i do so they went out and they talked about you know they they collaborated they went out and they talked to other district nurses in other areas around the country what were they doing and one of the shared ideas that came up was, you know, look at insurance companies. So they contracted with Metropolitan Life to do their assessments. And so Metropolitan Life would say, you know, you need to go out and you can do these 10 assessments. When they went out and they did that, Metropolitan Life paid them. So it wasn't that they got paid. They didn't have to, you know, do it for less money or no money. They got the payment, and from that payment, they were able oftentimes to sustain the viability of the agency. The uh, one record that um, in 1924, and it's just sort of like toward the end of the time period that I'm looking at, Leslie Wenzel is probably one of the most pivotal in individuals that comes into the early years of the uh, district nursing probably because of her educational experience and probably because of her work experience. Um, but this woman writes to her and she says, my dear Miss Wenzel, I'm glad to write to you in regard to my feeling about the visiting nurse societies taking over the work for Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. To my mind, the whole question goes back to our conception of the work of a visiting nurse society. The general trend seems, uh, seems to be to think of it primarily as a community organization of the people, for the people, and by the people. It is not for any special class in the community, such as the poor, for at last we realize that health is quite as much a universal question as education, and everybody's health is communities affect everybody's else. Out of the years of experience, we have found it to be more effective and economical for the work of the visiting nurse in a given community to be centered entirely in one agency, thus avoiding duplication, greatly saving in time and money, and making possible uniform standards, so much for general principles. These people are the same kind of people living in the same kind of homes with the same kind of problems as those who are not insured. In other words, they are just as much part of the community and therefore just as much our responsibility. And then this woman wrote, the uninsured. However, the fact that they are insured indicates a certain degree of thrift, of standard of living, and therefore show a desire to stand on their own feet that makes them particularly worthwhile and receptive of any kind of work or teaching that is done for them. In other words, these working people are down and out for the most part, but those living very close to the margin, who have taken care of in time of sickness, 
and taught how to keep themselves well may never fall below the margin of the class of the poor. They are therefore a very strategic group with which to work and most productive of a result. I can't think of anything else that I would have ever wanted to be but a nurse. And I can't think of anything else prouder to be than to be a nurse. But to have looked at and read through a remarkable history of this group of women from this time period and then all the way through, it just has been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. But that letter, I think you could take that date off and really think about it today. So that I'll close with that for all of us just to kind of contemplate that the health of all of us is the health of our community. Thank you. It's our intention to disband and, and go see the exhibition that we've been talking about, but before we do, if there are any questions, we'll be very happy to, uh, to answer them here, or we can do the answering in the art gallery. Well, I say let's get to the gallery then and see the exhibition. Thank you.